morning. Good morning, happy people. Go ahead, greet them. Good morning, happy people. You must be the happiest people in the world today. Morning, good morning, good morning. Are you happy today? You should be. After four weeks of continuous sermon on the book of Philippians, by this time you should be the happiest people on this planet Earth. Therefore, ask again the person next to you, really, are you happy? You know, many people think that happiness is simply a matter of luck. Do you believe that? No, it's not luck. It's a choice. It's a choice that we make. And the reason you're happy, because you made a choice. And the reason you are not, because you also made a choice. And not only that, happiness can be learned. And we are going to talk about that today, that happiness can be learned. In other words, there are certain qualities in life that when you have it, you will be happy. And then there are also qualities in life that when you don't have it, you're not going to be happy. And so it's so easy. All you have to do every day is get a piece of paper, put two columns. On one column, you put happiness. On the other column, you put unhappiness. And so you think of a word, of a quality. For example, I would say kindness. Kindness falls in what column? Of course, happiness. Cruelty. And happiness. Proud. And happiness. Humble. Happiness. Arrogant. And happiness. And all of this is so easy. All you have to do is put a, a, a line in your paper and you think of those qualities and you say, if I am going to have this quality, I'll be happy. If I am going to have this quality, I'll be very, very unhappy. And so today we are going to look at four very important qualities that we need to build up in our lives. We are going to learn from the life of Timothy and Epaphroditus. And Paul is going to write a thank you note to the church in Philippi, the church that he started in Greece. And so he's going to say thank you for what you have done. They have raised some money to help him. And so we begin in verse 19 down to verse 30. You have your Sunday guide? Okay. Verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Let's pray. Lord, speak to your word once again. May we learn those qualities in life that makes us happy. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you read this at first glance, you will say, there's nothing here. This is just a letter, a recommendation letter endorsing two people. It's a thank you letter. There's nothing here. So you say, nothing doctrinal over this. So you will continue to read on and not thinking about this passage over here. 
Sometimes that happens to us. But you know, we could be wrong. We could be very, very wrong because everything that has been written in the Bible has been written to teach us some lessons, some examples in life. And this is one of those. We are going to look into these passages four things that these two guys did that is worth following. They left us a good example that if you want to be happy, we should follow them. Four very, very important qualities. And so Paul here is writing back to the church in Philippi, and he's saying, I want you guys to use this, two guys, as your role model. Look at that. He said in verse 20, I have no one else like him. Stop for a moment. What is he saying? I have nobody else like him. In other words, he doesn't know anybody else who is like Timothy. And he's just so happy to recommend him. You know, when you read letters like that, you begin to stop and think deeply. This must be a very important person. For many of you who are applying for jobs, for example, and then you ask for recommendation, and the person says, you know, I highly recommend him or her. There's nobody else like him. That takes your attention immediately. Who is this guy? I mean, I better pay attention. I mean, he must be a very important person. Ever happened to you? And then the next guy over here, he says, I want you to welcome him. That's Epaphroditus, okay? I want you to welcome him and what? Give him honor. Why? Because he even nearly died for my sake. Wow, these guys must have done something for him to recommend them. And so we are going to see here four qualities that we need to follow. And the reason that Paul wrote in verse 19, the reason he wrote, he said, so that I may be cheered. In other words, I am doing this. I am sending them back to you in Philippi so that I will be happy. And then in verse 28, the reason I am sending Epaphroditus and Timothy back to you so that who is going to be happy? This time you will be happy. So it's not only Paul who is going to be happy. He wants the people in Philippi to be happy. And in verse 28, so that I may have less anxiety. Uh, these, these guys are something else, you know to have some kind of a recommendation. It's almost like, you know, as a pastor, I want all of you to be happy, really. Can you imagine a church where everybody is happy? We want that to happen to us. And so the first thing that we need to learn here, if you really, really want to be happy, and I believe the starting point for all happiness is this. The starting point, okay, it begins with this. Are you ready? Shift the focus away from ourselves. I believe with all my heart, this is the starting point for all happiness. We must learn to shift the focus from myself to other people. I must learn to take away the spotlight from myself and care for other people. Why? Because we are living in a world that it is all about me. We are living in a culture, the selfie culture. It's all about me. I want you to know where I'm eating now. I want you to know what I am eating now. I want you to know where I am now. So it's all about me. It's all about me, 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 me. Therefore, to shift the focus away from ourselves it's not natural because the tendency is to focus on us. And that's the kind of culture that we have today. It's all about me, 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 me. Therefore, it takes, put in your notes, intentionality. It takes intentionality to take away the focus from ourselves to other people. Yes, that is why, according to Paul, there's no one else like these guys. 
There's no one else like Timothy. He's just so concerned about the welfare of the church in Philippi. Well, these are the unselfish people. And unselfish people today are very, very rare. No one else like him who takes a genuine interest. And he, he places there genuine interest. He's not a fake. When he's concerned about you, he's concerned about you. The Good News Translation, watch this. He genuinely cares for you. Others only care about themselves. Again, we're talking here about focus. It's all a matter of focus. And it's all about intentionality. We have to change the focus. Yep. You have to shift the focus. And again, normally we don't do that. Remember two weeks ago, I gave you an illustration. When you walk into a room, when you walk into a place like this, and then I know you're going to eat out again, maybe at SM or Robinson. And when you walk through the hall of SM and Robinson, what is it that you're thinking about? I know you're thinking, what are they thinking about me? And then when you look up at, at SM, the second floor and the third floor, you really, really think all of those guys there are thinking about you. I'll tell you a secret. They're not thinking about you. They are so busy thinking about themselves. So stop thinking about yourself. Amen? I mean... The moment we come into a room, why don't you shift the focus? Instead of thinking about yourself, what can I do for these people? How can I help these people? How can I help the lonely? How can I help the needy? How can, when you walk into this campus over here, how can I help Ictus? What can I do? You know? But when you are thinking about yourself, the moment you come into a place like this, what can I get out of ictus? Turn it around. Turn it around. Then you are going to be very happy. Amen? Let's look at the Philip's translation. Same verse. Philip's translation says, they are all wrapped up in their own affairs. They are all wrapped up in their own affairs. Wrap up? Wow. Wow. Parang nabalot, no? They're all wrapped up. They couldn't think of anybody else. They're always thinking about themselves. Single adults, are you here? You want to get married? You want a date? Some fatherly advice. Okay? Fatherly advice. I think it is better to sit at home alone without a date than to have a date who thinks only about himself or herself. Hello? You know, when you have somebody who is also wrapped up about himself or herself, he or she is no gift to you. He or she doesn't care about you. He is only thinking about himself. Amen, young people? Oh, hindi lang magsabat. Sige. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. The message paraphrase. Everybody, please read. Don't be so obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. You see this? You know, you're so obsessed that you can take advantage of other people. And so when you talk to people, sometimes you know and you know that they are not concerned about what you're talking to them. They're already looking out for somebody to talk to because wala siya kwaon sa imo. They want to talk to people that take advantage of. And then when he talks to you, there's nothing here, so he moves on to another person, to another person, another person. And for some people, they cannot lend a helping hand to others because they are so obsessed with their own advantage. I know this is not easy to do because everything in our culture today, it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. 
And many factors are responsible for, you know, creating this kind of culture, especially the advertising uh, people. And they have done this through the years, and they have already brainwashed us. For example, let's take the case of Coca-Cola. Open happiness. You know what that means? When you are not happy today, all you have to do is open the bottle, and then you drink, I'm happy. Is that happiness? All you have to do is drink Coca-Cola, and you are happy. Sige, you drink it the whole day. Okay. Happiness is something that you drink, according to them. Well, the other one is a car, OD. Joy is something you drive, so buy a car, buy OD, and finally, you have meaning in life. You have joy. Oh, sige, you buy your, your joy, you buy OD, so the moment you step out of the car, you're not happy anymore, so you drive 24 hours a day. Okay, in order for you to be happy, you know. You see the, the, the message there, the subliminal message, you know. What about this guy over here, Pepsi? All that matters is today. Meaning what? You have to live for today. You know, don't plan for tomorrow. Forget about the past. The most important thing is today, now, now, now. And what is important? Drink Pepsi. Yeah. The other one is Sprite. Obey your thirst. Whatever comes into your mind, whatever comes in your heart, your desire, you go for it. So when you look at Sprite, there it is. I'm happy with Sprite. And all of these are what we call subliminal messages. You know, you don't really mind it, but before you know it, you're doing it. There's another one, Burger King. Have it your way. Oh, that's not a bad advice when you're ordering a hamburger. But I think when you shift that to a relationship, that's not good. Have your way in your relationship. You do what you like. So it's all about me, 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 you, you, you. I think there's another one here. I think it's Maggie. Happiness is homemade. <laughs> Local. <laughs> Happiness is homemade. I think there's another one here. Really, this one. Just do it. Just do it. Whatever comes into your mind, just do it. So it's the culture now. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. And the more we believe that, the more we are not going to be happy because that is not the formula to happiness. Let's go to the second one. If you really, really want to be happy, you have to become someone whom people can trust. I believe so. Some of you are so happy today because many people can trust you. They can trust you with their money. They can trust you with their lives. They can trust you with everything. And that's the reason why you are happy. And if people cannot trust you, I don't think you are happy. Proverbs 13 says this. Those who cannot be trusted are on the road to ruin. Obviously, yes. So therefore, you can see that these are qualities. And these are qualities that we can learn to develop in life. We have to develop trustworthiness. We have to learn how to be reliable. We have to learn how to be dependable. We have to learn how to be consistent in life. And slowly, young people, especially the next generation, as you develop the quality in your life, you will be happy because the more people are going to trust you. Can you imagine if you apply for a job and nobody wants to recommend you? Especially today, it's a dangerous thing, this, this technology. One time I saw in the U.S., I know somebody who wanted to know somebody, and he has to pay an agency a certain fee to know about this person. And he got it. And immediately you can tell 
his track record, how much he pays the bill, you know, everything is there. So it's very, very dangerous today. We have to watch out. And not only that, because the more people trust you, the more you are going to be happy. And so Timothy is being used as an example here by Paul, verse 22. Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. In other words, this guy is authentic. This guy is genuine. This guy is reliable. Masaligan ni siya. He's masaligan. I have worked with him. You can count on this guy. So be very careful. The next generation, I'm sure you're going to ask for work. You're going to apply for work. And people need to recommend you sometimes. And all it does is a single statement on the FB can either move you to success or destroy you because people can either trust in you or people cannot trust in you. God's word translation. You know what kind of person Timothy proved to be? So back the question, what kind of a person you are? Are you trustworthy? Can people really depend on you? In your workplace, can they depend on you? Can they trust you? Wow, big, big question. But as far as Timothy is concerned, according to Paul, this guy has proven himself. Tested, proven, verified, credit check, approved. He is due for a loan anytime. Okay? So today, it's very dangerous. So take care of in your uh, trustworthiness because it is so easy to know who you are. Therefore, are you what you say you are? Or are you putting up a mast? In ancient times, in the Greek theater, they don't have enough actors. So you know what they do? One actor can play three to five roles. And so what they do, they give him a mast. You put on a mast, that's one role. After that, you go backstage, you put on another mast, you get out. After that, you go back, put another mask, you go back, and the same thing they do that every now and then. And they have a word for that. The same guy wearing different masks. In Greek, it is called hypocrites. That is where the word comes from, hypocrites. So one guy, you wear different masks. For us today, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody who is different on Sunday morning and tomorrow morning in the workplace is also different. In the afternoon with his barcada, he's different. And when he goes home at night, he's also different. What do you call that? He's a hypocrite. He wears different masks. Therefore, you cannot depend on him. You cannot trust him. Can you develop this reputation for dependability? Oh, yes, you can. Like I said, we can learn this. We can develop this. So number one, you have to learn how to live with integrity. Integrated, you know. Pariho lang. It's all the same. So when you have integrity, it means your actions... Not just your word. Integrity means your word, not just your actions. Or what you see is what you get. Simple as that. And that's a man with integrity. Because a man without integrity, what he says is different from his behavior. So you cannot tell when you talk to him. He's a different person. And that by the time he turns around, something different happens. You cannot trust his word. He has no integrity. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but bottom line is what he says matches his actions. 
Proverbs 25, verse 19. Putting confidence in unreliable person is like chewing with a toothache or walking on a broken foot. Ooh. He's talking about dependability. You, when you want to chew something hard and you have a toothache, it doesn't help. You cannot depend. Or when you have a broken foot and you want to walk, you cannot depend on a broken foot. And the same thing he says, putting confidence in an unreliable person, you know, you cannot depend on them. It brings more harm than good. So again, I think that the greatest ability that we can learn in life, dependability. Put in your note, dependability. Can people depend on you? Can people depend on you? Can they rely on you? Can they trust you? And if this is who you are, that's the reason why you are very, very happy. Proverbs 28, 20. Honest people will lead a full, happy life. I don't think it's in your notes, okay? Honest people will lead a full and a happy life. I believe so. Okay. The other one is, not only that you are going to live with integrity, but we have to learn how to keep our promises. Wow. We can also learn this to keep our promises. Ang iba naman niya, they're so used to this, promises are made to be broken. You believe that? No. We have to learn to keep our promises. Psalms 15, verse 4. These people always do what they promise, no matter how much it may cost them. There is another version, the King James Version. It says, God blesses the person who sweareth to his own hurt. Sweareth to his own hurt. What does that mean? It means that when you make a promise to somebody, and then after a while you found out that it is going to cost you more, if you fulfill the promise. But you still do it because you made a promise. And the Bible says, God blesses the person who does it. Wow. Reliable. Dependable. Keeping your promise no matter how much it will cost you. Mm, number three. Not only that we are going to live with integrity and we need to keep our promises... We have to learn how to work well with others. Learn how to work well with others. I wonder if they still teach this at school. But even if they do, as parents, I think we should teach this to our children. Yes, we should teach our children these things. We should teach our children to switch their focus away from themselves. You see, if we don't teach them these things, they are going to become spoiled brats. I hate to say this, but I just heard it last week in our meeting in Manila, and I hope it's not true. Because we were there for a national meeting representing Region 6, 7, 8, Mindanao, all over, and each one gives their report. But in that conversation, in, more, in the table, hmm, their perception of the people in Negros are spoiled brats. Is that true? I don't know. I got hurt because I'm from here. But they say, come over there, mga spoiled brats. I don't know. I hope it's not true. That is why we should teach our children, this generation, not to be spoiled brats. Because the perception of other people is that the people here are spoiled brats. Wow, well, I hope that's not true. What do you think? We have to teach our children to learn to become someone who is trustworthy. We should. And we have to teach our children how to work well with other people. 
Yes. And also, there's another perception working with others. They say on a national scale, you people there in Negros, your leadership is fragmented. You don't cooperate with one another. Is that true? I don't know. I was hurt. I don't know. That's according to them. But we people in the vow are working together. We cooperate for the betterment of the vow. You people there, I don't know. I'm hurt. We have to teach children how to work together. Because by the time they grow up, even on a national level, they learn how to work with one another. Amen? Therefore, we need to learn two things. As the Bible says, we need, number one, learn how to cooperate. Yes, and that's something that doesn't come naturally. So we have to teach the young generation, our children, how to share their toys, how to cooperate with one another. And these are skills that we can teach them. The second thing is this. Paul gives another example of this quality, Epaphroditus, verse 25. I send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. I love this. Of course, you know the background here. This guy was asked by the church in Philippi to carry a, an offering to help Paul in prison. And he was being described by Paul as a brother, a fellow worker, and a fellow soldier. In other words, what Paul is saying, you know this guy, he's a team player. He knows how to work as a group. He's not a lone ranger. He's not a prima donna. So the more you learn how to work with other people, the happier you're going to be in life. And if you don't know how to work with other people, different from you, I'm very sorry, because most of the world will be entirely different from you. So we need to learn these simple skills of working together so that we can be happy. So Paul is using here a relational metaphor. And what he's saying, you know, this guy is a brother. That means he's part of the family. We're all part of the family here. The moment you become a Christian, the moment Christ is in you and you're in Christ. So we are going to be stuck up together for all eternity. The person sitting next to you is a brother in the Lord. The, the sister sitting next to you is a sister in the Lord forever and ever. Okay, go ahead. Hello, brother. Go. Hello, brother. Hello, sister. We are stuck up forever. You are stuck up forever. There's nothing you can do. You are a brother in the Lord. You are a sister in the Lord. And then Paul says, this guy is a fellow worker. We work together. We serve together. We have the same great commission. We have the same great commandment. We do the same things. It's serving the Lord. You know, we have a fellowship. And then he says, you know, He's a fellow soldier. Every day is a spiritual warfare. And so we fight the same enemy. We defend each other. We encourage each other. You know, we build each other up. In other words, this guy is a team player. He can be one thing over here. He can be another thing over here. And all of this in our setting happens in the setting of a small group. Why? Because in a small group, the family is there. The fellowship is there. And, you know, the, the, the battle is there. So we pray for one another. Okay? So not only do I need to learn to cooperate, but here's the second one. I need to learn to be considerate. Wow, this is a big one. Number two, I need to learn to be considerate. The more considerate you are, the happier you are going to be. The more inconsiderate you are, the more unhappy you are going to be. Do you believe that? I'm sure after this service, many of you are going to eat out somewhere. I want you to watch inconsiderate people, how they treat waiters, 
how they treat parking lot ng mga attendants, how they treat people who are of less, you know, lesser than them. Are they considerate or are they inconsiderate? And for those who are inconsiderate, they make the other people unhappy. And not only they make other people unhappy, they themselves are going to be very unhappy. But for people who are considerate, they are happy. And because they are considerate, they make another, pe another person happy. Amen? So tell the person next to you, be considerate. How do you do that? How do you do that? Be thoughtful of other people. In other words, can we learn to be kind? Can we learn to be sympathetic and understanding of other people? And so again, he mentions Epaphroditus in verse 26. Uh, now I must send him, Epaphroditus, back to you because he longs to see all of you. Why? Because he has been worried about your distress. That's called consideration. He's worried. He's worried about them in Philippi since you heard that he was sick. Can you imagine this guy? He was so worried because he learned that they were worried in Philippi. And because they were worried that they heard he, was, he nearly died, he got so worried about their worry. Now he's worrying again. Can you imagine? And this is consideration. I don't want you to worry. I'm okay. I'm okay. And so Paul is saying, I am sending him back. In the message translation, he says, he wants to get back and reassure you that he is fine. So he said, I want you to be happy. I want you to see me in person. I'm okay. Although I nearly died, but I'm okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay? You know, to be considerate, you can apply this in all kinds of relationship and it will work. Especially if you're having an unhappy marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Everybody please read 1 Corinthians. You must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. Can you see the word must? It's a must. It's not an option. You must get along with each other. And not only that, you must learn. You, know, you have to do it. You have to. It's not an option. You have to learn to be considerate of one another. And then you must cultivate a life in common. And so to cultivate takes time. Like what you're doing with your garden. You have to water it. You have to have the sunshine and all of these cultivating things. It takes time. It takes effort. Therefore, in every relationship, if you are considerate, then you must do this. You have to be considerate. You must learn to be considerate because this does not come naturally. By nature, we are not considerate. By nature, we don't want to cultivate a relationship. By nature, we don't want to work. You know, if the, relation, the relationship does not happen, it's okay. It's okay. But Paul says, no, you must. You must. You must. Say with me, you must. Therefore, what are we going to do? You have to be thoughtful. You have to be thoughtful of the effect of our words to other people. We have to be thoughtful of the effect of our actions to other people. And of course, this does not come naturally. Kung pabayaan ng gitgitaya, ang bakbak tanay pagustuhan talingid. Some people say, this is who I am. Whatever comes into my mind, ihambal ko gina iya, pag bahala na kamo. You met people like that? Para sila iya, pag gusto lang ko iya sa mbakba ko, kung iya mbak, bahala ka na kung masaktan ka. Have you met people like that? They are not considerate. I'm sorry, there's a word for you. 
one word. If this is you, and I hope you're not, you are very, very rude. You are very rude. Pag gusto ka lang yamahambal, other ka, you're not considering other people. You're not considering the effect of what you're saying. Someday, you will also face the consequences of what you're saying. What does it take to be considerate? What does it take to hold on to your mouth and to your tongue? What does it take to pause before you say anything? I think it takes character. I think it takes a little more intelligence. I think it takes education to do that. To hold on to your tongue. And not just to say what you want to say. Amen? Hello? Okay, po sinyo. 1 Corinthians 10.33. Look at the example of Paul. I don't just do what I like or what is best for me, but what is best for everyone. That's more important. So they may be saved. When it comes to conversion, when it comes to salvation, according to Paul, his priority would always be others before his comfort. Number four, if you want to be happy, this one is a big one. This one is really, really big. And if you do this, I guarantee you, you will be happy for all eternity. Amen? Live for something worth dying for. Unless you have this, you will not have the ultimate happiness in your life. So you have to learn to die for something worth dying for. What do I mean? You see, today many people are giving allegiance, giving loyalty, giving their big time commitment, their money, their efforts, everything that they have to things that will not even last forever. They're giving everything to whatever they're doing today that will not even matter five years from now, that will not even matter after they die. They're giving so much to these things that when they die and face their creator, and when God says, welcome my good and faithful servant, because you have done this, the Lord say, it doesn't matter. I am not asking for you to do that. That's your success. I'm asking for what did you do, the little things that you do to serve me as you serve other people. Is it worth dying for? Is it worth dying for, all these things? You answer that. So if you want to be happy, you have to live for something worth dying for. And the best use of your life is really to invest it in something that will last for all eternity. You need to live for something worth dying for. And you know what they say? You are not ready to live until you know what's worth dying for. And it's a pity, especially if you're getting old and you have not yet figured out what life is all about. And you're still giving so much allegiance to this thing. It's almost, almost like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. He was getting old and then he said, I built palaces. I, I gathered all the gold and the silver. I have 700 wives and 300 concubines. I have 3,000 Arabian horses. I have singers from all over the world. You know, I have all of this. I have all of this. I was the greatest. I was the greatest. And then at the end of his life, what did he say? Everything is? It's meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. I have given all my loyalty, my allegiance to these things. And the bottom line, he says, chasing after the wind. And then he said, bottom line, fear God and obey his commandments. This is what matters after all. You know, when you go towards the end of your life and you have not yet figured this out, I'm really, really sorry for you. 
Paul ends with this about Epaphroditus, 27 and 30. Indeed, he was very ill, and he almost died. He risked his life for the work of Christ and was at the point of death while trying to do for me the things you, his friends, couldn't do because you were far away. You know what happened here? This guy, there was a little meeting in Philippi, 800 miles away, and they said, hey, let's gather some money to help Paul in Rome. They gathered the money and said, we need someone who will give it to him. And then somebody would have said, how much will it cost? Can I ride a plane? No plane. No train? No train. What am I going to do? Walk. Walk? Walk 800 miles so you can deliver a meager love offering to the Apostle Paul. He made a commitment. And along the way, he got sick. It could have been diarrhea. It could have been dehydration. But he almost died. And he could have quit and said, that's it. That's it. I am going to go back. I couldn't do it. But he made a commitment and made sure he finished it and he gave it to Paul. What do you call that? This guy knows how to live for something worth dying for so that the ministry of Paul will continue. He made a commitment. He finished it. My question for us today what commitment have you started in life that you have not yet finished? Have you made a commitment to your spouse? Have you made a commitment to your children? Have you made a commitment to somebody? Have you made a commitment to Ictus? Have you made a commitment to God? May we also make good the commitment that we made. And that will spell the difference between your happiness and your unhappiness. I don't know. Let me end by saying this. For as long as you are in ictus here, God will always ask you to do something bigger than yourself. Meaning God will always ask you to stretch your faith. He will. However, will you do it or not? We are always asking you to join small groups. But maybe for some, thank you. God will honor you because you're part of the small group. I hope you're not one of those who say, I will not because it is not comfortable and it is not convenient. A little sacrifice. Just to be with people who are also lonely. Just to be with people that you can pray for and you're not willing to do it because it is not convenient and it is not comfortable. In the end, may we all be like Epaphroditus and Timothy. And what Paul says, if you do it, these are the people God will honor in the end. Amen? So for as long as you're alive, believe me, God will always test your faith, especially if you're in ictus. There are so many things that we need to do here in Ictus. We need small group leaders. We need ministry leaders. We need all of you to be a part of this. And all it takes is to pray two very simple words. Use me. Again, use me. Are you willing to pray this dangerous prayer? Let's bow our heads. Lord, as we bow our heads, you are challenging us to make a commitment and to make good that commitment. And if you want God to use you between you and God, could you please just say those two little words from the bottom of your heart? Make sure it's a genuine commitment. If you're not ready to say it, please don't say it. Because God will always take you seriously. Go ahead. Say, use me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. One last verse. Mark 8, 35. 
It's in your Sunday guide. I want everyone to read it. Not there? Oh, there it is at the bottom. Everybody please read Mark 8.35. Only those who give away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be happy. We want to be like Timothy and Epaphroditus. We know, dear God, that it's a matter now of learning these qualities. Lord, we can choose to be happy. Lord, we can make decisions to be happy. Lord, we can develop our character that will make us happy. Lord, teach us to start refocusing off from ourselves to you and to other people. Lord, forgive me. I have always been thinking about myself. Lord, teach me to be reliable. Teach me to be dependable. Teach me to be trustworthy. Lord, teach me how to get along with other people, how to cooperate with people. And above all, Lord, teach me how to be considerate. Lord, thank you for Timothy and Epaphroditus. May we follow their example. And Lord, I just prayed, use me. I don't know what that means, but I know that I need to trust you because you are going to stretch my faith from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Happy people. See you next week now.